Happy Friday. We are here with, well, it's not Friday for people listening, but it's Friday for, for the three of us. So uh, we wrangled Candace Carlisle into joining us today. So Candace, thank you for doing that. And it's afternoon on, it's almost happy hour for, for you guys. Um, Candace is a senior reporter at CoStar News um, and covers commercial real estate in Texas and beyond. And She's covered the North Texas region and real estate industry for nearly 15 years. We say that not to date you, but to uh, focus on your depth of experience. Uh, I have a little seasoning on me. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. We love it. So um, you were at ULI in Dallas last week, which was like a small 5,000 person gathering. Gio uh, thought you would have a lot of great perspective just about what's happening in commercial real estate in general right now. And Gio and I focus on flex obviously, but thanks for joining us. And we can't, we can't wait to hear. Yeah. What you're seeing out there. Well, I, I feel like I, um, am coming just after a conference. So, you know, I feel like all of the conference topics are top of mind. And so, um, was able to not only, you know, see what was going on in capital markets, which I guess it's not going on. That's what's going on. (laughs) That's a good way to put it. And, (laughs) um, And, uh, you know, I was able to also sit in on some office panels um, and, you know, everyone's still talking about flight to quality and there's more talk about, you know, this idea of flex and how flex needs to be used in a portfolio. Um, It's kind of interesting, though, because at the same time uh, we got to I was in on the fireside chat with um, J.P. Morgan Chase's head of global real estate. I know no small task, but you know, they have that giant project. I think it's like what, 3 billion, 4 billion. I forget how many billions, but it's in the billion range on the project that they're uh, developing in Manhattan. You know, they're trying to get everybody under one roof. What does that look like? And um, it's, it's just interesting because, you know, you have this uh, dichotomy, it seems between like these, um, these office developments that are still going on, but, you know, they have to have all the amenities, they have to have all the uh, bells and whistles, you know, to sort of appease like um, these big corporate giants, because, you know, JP Morgan Chase, you know, they, he was saying they use this as a, a recruitment tool, and a place that, you know, isn't only for employees in Manhattan, but sort of something where people will go from all over the world, yeah. and they want, I mean, it's JP Morgan Chase on the front stage, what does that look like? And so, you know, they're they're dolling up their Park Avenue address quite nicely from what I hear. I haven't personally visited the construction site or anything, but the renderings look uh, quite amazing. Um, so I feel like we're tell of two cities, tell of two types of real estate. I mean, I feel like, you know, you've got like these big projects, these long-term leases, you know, because the construction costs keep going up. So, you know, unless, unless someone's willing to sign like a 15 year lease, Sometimes the build outs just don't make sense. And at the same time, people are just as excited and talking just as much about flex and how there needs to be more flex in uh, the real estate world. So that's, those were the conversations, you know, and I think, uh, you know, if the JP Morgan chases of the world could sign two year leases at a time and the landlords would let them do that they would do that (laughs) because I feel like there's just so much uncertainty and, you know, it's interesting. You get a group of executives at like these big conferences and, um, you know, no one really knows what the next 10 years will be. Everyone's just trying to see how they can pivot best. So anyway, how about that for a long winded answer? (laughs) Yeah. And that's what I love about, uh, about my interactions with you, Candice, and why I thought you'd be perfect is you, you get to touch so many different uh, parts of the industry, right? I mean, with, with all your uh, your research and your articles about, you know, we've we've had a lot about flex. Obviously, you just tapped into the capital markets and how the interest rates have affected things so much. Um, you are pulled into some of the drama with uh, with real estate professionals leaving and uh, and negotiations and, and everything that comes with that, but, but also talking about developments and the future of flex. And I mean, so many amazing things that allow for 
for you to become a subject matter expert to a certain extent from, you know, just regurgitating information from other people. Right. I mean, I think that's, I know that's awesome. it's, it's just who I talk to. I mean, I feel like I, um, I just, I learn on the fly. I try to educate them myself the best I can so I can be prepared for interviews, especially when I'm, you know, put in front, in front of certain people, but you know, yeah, I regurgitate and I just kind of like absorb, I'm like a sponge that I just go around and observe, absorb information. But yeah, learning on the fly for sure. Um, well, that's, that's the beauty of it, right? Is, I mean, I, I tell people I, well, I've gotten to where I am by regurgitating, right? I mean, I still remember <laughs> by when I joined Regis, I basically mimicked what uh, Michael Beretta, who's been there for 30 something years and is head of real estate would say and do until I believed it and understood it, right? <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, that's such a big part. And, you know, also when you have conversations with multiple people and you hear it from multiple professionals within the industry, right? Or in your case, hear it from multiple uh, enterprise users, how they're, they're going into flex. Um, I mean, right now you're working on a really, really cool assignment, right? Talking about how enterprise and co-working tie together, which is really neat. Yeah. I mean, um, I think it's going to become more seamless in the future. It's just people are trying to figure out how to get there because it's like, they see this destination they want to get to where they have a certain percentage of their portfolio flex, but they're just not really sure how they take those small little steps because, you know, you still have um, these legacy projects that really put a company's brand and um, sense of place for its employees on a platform. And that's equally as important. So it'll be interesting because I feel like you've got like this like everyday need space and then you have like this big showroom. This is where the meetings are. This is where, you know, um, the, the, the brokers in Manhattan, <laughs> you know, go to feel special. So uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it all sort of takes shape. So what, what was the, the general sort of vibe at ULI? Was it sort of one of one grounded in reality or, um, you know, I think Jamie Dimon is kind of infamous for his, you know, comments. I, I just pulled up, you know, a business insider quote, you know, mm -hmm. Jamie Dimon told client clients that remote work slows down honesty and decision-making. <laughs> so he's, you know, on one end of the spectrum, but because ULI would be, you know, pretty in, people pretty incented to have people like keep doing what they've always done. Right, right. I mean, it's a it's a group of like nearly forty thousand real estate professionals, land use individuals. Yeah, and they're all very hyped up on urban land use, yeah. uh, making use of underutilized spaces, that kind of thing. So yeah, um, I think I think the uh, the sentiment is there where they they would love for everyone to be equally enthusiastic about going to the office. Um, but, you know, in that fireside chat, I mentioned with their global head of real estate, he's like, there was never a hundred percent at the office. Like, it's almost anyway, like we're trying right. to get to this bigger, well, no one was tracking it to the, in this sort of depth or in this sort of detail before. Um, so like, what are we trying to get to? I mean, and I think for every company, for every individual, the answer is going to be different. I think people are just looking to where, where they're most productive. Um, and for everyone, that's going to be a slightly different based on your profession, based on, you know, introvert, extrovert, you know, talking too much avert, you know, whatever that <laughs> is. I mean, that's my problem is like, I see people in the office and I'm a talker. Well, at the end of the day, I mean, that's, that's great and all, but no one's, no one besides people that don't need to listen, you know, I need to, I need to talk to a wider audience. The way I need to do that is to actually sit down and write instead of, you know, talking and networking and doing all the things that, you know, are fun to do, but don't make me a productive employee. Right. So, so for you going into a setting where there that exists might be fun if you need, like, if you need that, like you need to be sort of re-energized, but for you, that's yeah. not as productive. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, my, like I'm in, I let's take my um, individual circumstances. I work in a sales office. I am a news reporter. So I don't have a, I'm a team of one. 
basically like my my editor sits in Houston we're never going to be sitting side by side on a daily basis working unless I travel to Houston or she travels to Dallas so um a lot of times and I'll show you this group this is this is my productive room but as you can see you know I'm closed off I'm trying to I'm solo in a conference room nobody nobody really cares what I have to say I mean I'm saying like you know, how was your weekend? Tell me about your kids. You know, like I saw yeah. this video the other day, with this cat that was doing some crazy stuff. You know what I mean? Like, um, my circumstance is probably better working alone. There's no group thought to yeah. writing an article other than yeah. me trying to get comments from sources on the phone really quick. Yeah. Or if I'm at ULI covering a panel, I'm out in, in the environment right. or I'm yeah, writing yeah. like, it's one or the other. So I, I feel like my individual circumstance is very much like everyone else's individual circumstance. We are all going to be so different in how we're productive and what we need to do in order to be considered successful in our roles of work. So, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's something where there needs to be more individualism or whatever sort of put in the workplace, but how do you go about doing that and making everyone equally happy. I don't know if you can. I mean, there's no one cubicle sit it's all, <laughs> it's right? All right. <laughs> yep. So. And so that's the interesting part is back to your point is people don't realize how the world has shifted and changed, right? I mean, no one was tracking how often people were in the office, what that looked like, any of that stuff. But I mean, I maybe mean, 50 or 60% is as good as it gets. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even the great example, when I reached out to you this morning, you're like, okay, where are we meeting? And I was like, uh, it's online. It's on Zoom, right? There's no need for us to get together. I know. So um, all, all I was like, okay, I need good Wi-Fi. Got it. I'm 15 minutes away from good Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. And, and that's, that's the beauty of it is, I mean, there's such a, back to your point of a flight to quality, right? And it's a quality of life uh, in addition to product, right? I mean, I think you recently wrote an article and I think it's, it'd be really interesting to get your take from that article, right? I, I think the basis was around pickleball. Was what? It yes. <laughs> okay. yes. Fill us in. Um, <laughs> so I was chatting there. I think it was a financial services firm and I talked to the managing huh? partner and apparently a lot, they recruit a lot of young talent and pickleball is a thing for them. So when they were talking to a developer about what kind of amenities would, you know, appeal to them specifically, he was like, yeah, we could do a pickleball court, like, let's do it. And so um, it really sort of helped solidify the deal. Now, not all properties have space for a pickleball court and not all leases kind of, you know, uh, can dictate how a property is developed, but in this case, it, it, it worked and um, I think, you know, I've talked to some other landlords and they've sort of wanted to also explore the pickleball option, but I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can sort of lure someone to your, uh, office property. Right. And I don't know, maybe, maybe pickleball's the next thing in co-working, you know, maybe, maybe this development will land a, um, that's really funny. Well, co-working loves a flex office space. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, I don't know. Anything that kind of brings people together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, was having drinks last night with Mara Hauser. I don't yes, ever run into yes. her. Do you know who she, who she is? Yes. Well, remember you're not supposed yeah. to talk about it, Burr. Her husband was talking to Mara. Oh, that's right. Gosh, I prepared you and everything. You totally forgot. You can have, okay. you, that's okay. She's lovely. She's super lovely. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> she was in town. Her daughter lives here. Her daughter's 26 and Sam and Sam was saying that her boyfriend's startup company, uh, biotech startup is moving to the South Bay, um, which is further away from where everyone lives. And mm -hmm. he sent a picture to her and said, I will never work here. It's like gr Mara called it gray space. It's like somebody's old cubicles. Literally, it's like the low ceilings and just mm -hmm. cubicles. And this is like a biotech startup. They used to have, you know, the free snacks, all the things, but it makes me, I think to your point, like you have to really think about this mindset of, you know, people want to feel like they have a lot of empowerment now, I think, mm -hmm. right? Like his response was, well, the work environment and the commuter are that important to me. So I'm not going to do it anymore if I, if it's not right. And the, the pickleball thing 
yeah, people go because they want like some energy at work. They want to connect mm-hmm. with people. They want something that's not at home. So that's a great yeah. example. Yeah. I've never played. Have you played? I haven't played, but I've written about it <laughs> to where people are out now asking if I play like I think on the regular, like my colleagues. It, so so you're... I think I'm going to have to. <laughs> Um, which is great because, uh, as Gio knows, I, I played soccer in a, a former life, but, you know, injuries and, you know, becoming, I'm again, seasoned, <laughs> um, I'm kind of thinking I need to pick up a, a less violent intense. sport. <laughs> yeah. It's intense. Yeah. I mean, it's full contact, you know, you're playing co-ed, you know, it's it, sometimes, uh, I swear some of the Friday night games got a little bit, um, to, I mean, I'm like, we're old at the end of the day. Does anyone need to walk home on crutches? And you, you'd have guys going like, yeah, I got to win this game. Cause you know, I had a horrible time at like my job's not going anywhere right. or so whatever. They're just, yeah. So they, they have to win. I mean, it becomes very personal. So, um, but you know, it's, uh, I pickleball. I mean, <laughs> you have to, br- you have to build a reason to get people yeah. to go to work and it has to be something that's not just work. <laughs> so well, I'll tell you, I was never able to play in that. I think I tried yeah. that Friday night league one time. Uh-huh. And I just the transition was just too difficult for me to do the whole co-ed thing because so you did the men. See, that was smart. I should have just meaning stayed you with couldn't women. like pull it back. What do you mean the transition? Well, the, the problem was is you had uh, you know, without going down a rabbit hole that, that we don't <laughs> want to go down and get in trouble is <laughs> You, you, you go out there and you have these women that, uh, that go in easy. Right. And so you don't want to hurt them. So you don't yeah. want to go in hard, but then you have these women that come in super hard and it's like, you don't even, where do you make the transition and mm. how, you know, and that was always my deal is I said, when I couldn't play at 110% anymore, I'd stop playing. And so, you know, you'd go out there and you didn't know to what level to play. Right. And you'd upset women because you went in too hard. And then you'd upset women because you didn't go in hard enough um so and vice versa from yeah. the women to the guy the guy same thing you know yeah. some guys were like oh my gosh I don't want to even play uh, I might break you and then other guys are like you know I, I will break you <laughs> I will break you <laughs> yeah how dare you take that ball from me I mean that it, you it's it, sometimes I feel like some guys would get insulted like you've just yeah. like upset their life you know you know because you just you know anyway <laughs> and it's interesting how our industry is so much that way, right? It's uh, our, our lives are that way. I mean, mm-hmm. we deal and I'll tell you, Jamie and I, you know, we've got personalities within the flex industry and, you know, people we interact with that you're just yeah. like, wow, I'm just, we're trying to collaborate. <laughs> we're all on the same team here. And then you, you get people that, that are all about realizing that we are in a, in a business of co-opetition, right? We're, we're competing, but we're also collaborating. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, a lot of times I think, that's the best way to go about it, right? Is we're but in all, we're all overlap. You're, not, you're probably not going after the same ball at the same time. So it's easier. <laughs> yeah. That's true. There's a few other balls on the field. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's funny we that you said that. So Sam was a goalie. I coach soccer and I referee. And so I was trying to talk Mara's daughter into being a goalie coach next year for our league. And she so cool. mentioned she also plays in a co-ed league and she's done because she got flattened in a game. And she said, she stood up and said to the guy, like, why did you do that? Literally, you know, like, like I don't like, even I have don't the know. ball. <laughs> yeah. Some guys are yeah. just like, I, I don't know. Something's out of, out of whack with co-ed where it just, I feel like there's some sense and reason that just Tricky. goes out the window and maybe, um, I don't know. I've gotten injured to where I'm done on co-ed. If I ever return, it'll be to like old lady soccer or something. So <laughs> old ladies, masters, you call it masters, <laughs> the soccer. masters, yes. well, people that know how to play soccer, but we're kind of done, you know, doing this WWF. Don't want soccer to, thing. WWF soccer. <laughs> totally. I love it. Anyway, we're, uh, we're, we're digressing. We're, we're, we're way fun. off time. Um, <laughs> But I mean, going back to pickleball, it's funny that we're talking about injuries. That's and how we got else. onto soccer. See, there we go. I had, a, I had a buddy that literally posted the other day. He was, he's in uh, on the Morgan side doing residential. He's one of the top residential uh, brokers in the country. He's got an awesome team here in Dallas. And he, he actually speaks on uh, 
on coaching and the industry and all kinds of stuff. He was in California for a big event and was playing pickleball at a social function and tore his a uh, his Achilles playing pickleball. Wow. That's intense. Uh, wow. And- and, and, and Wally doesn't know how to go. So to... pickleball is also dangerous. Hmm, good to know. <laughs> no, <it's> a... <laughs> uh, pickleball is dangerous for seasoned people who are <laughs> limbs are not used to twisting and turning in the same capacity as, as they used to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting just considering the shift off of the pickleball, but the amenitization of, of spaces now and what, what these enterprise users are looking for, right? It's not just the typical cafe and gym. I mean, I'm having mm-hmm. conversations with a local big developer who's trying to create a kind of a, a, a I think he explained it, uh, Candace, you'll get this as a poor man's uh, old Parkland. Oh, and so, <laughs> uh, and so he's talking Wait, about- For those of us who are not, you know, Southerners. Or tech no, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll, I'll, I'll bring you up to speed on that real quick in a second. But basically, he wants to monetize it. So there's an actual restaurant, not just a cafe, right? And oh, so that's, cool. that's the goal is to create that, to create a, a space where there, it's not only a gym, you've got personal trainers, you've got all that kind of stuff. And I think that's part of where we're headed. Uh, but give you, Jamie, uh, so I'll, and I'll send you information on it too, but Old Parkland is the Old Parkland Hospital Campus in Dallas. I mean, it's, did you ever watch the, the, the movie Skulls? You never watched I'm the movie? I'm gonna go Skulls? no. I, I oh didn't my either. Gosh. You didn't either? <laughs> I know. Oh. Okay, so we're gonna so have to- So I'll have to send it to you. So yeah. Skulls is about a secret society at these Ivy League schools. Oh. I mean, if, if, if I get taken taken out, you guys know why. Um, hashtag QAnon, right? Um, but, <laughs> but either way, uh, Old Parkland is essentially a, a campus that the Trammell Crow family basically put together. It's a really cool development, but it's basically old, uh, a lot of old money and blue bloods, if you will. So you've got a lot of family uh, offices are in there. You've got a bunch of developers. You've got all kinds of stuff. But I mean, Obviously, for you, Jamie, it's not a big deal. But here, average office rates, even at a A class, is about 40, 45 bucks. Here, it's 75 plus. And you have to go through an interview process to even wow. be able to lease space. But the reality is, is they've got like a really cool uh, campus, which people joke around about how it's a secret society, but it really is just a really unique campus that has a full cafeteria with you know, white glove huh. service. Um, they've got, I mean, everything you can imagine. I mean, I think they even have uh, residences in there that, that some of these people actually live in or can utilize because they live in other places or everything else. But I mean, that's the idea is, so it's it's actually a location that that is really central that we're talking about for this for this other concept. It's sort of a club. Yeah. I mean, it's real estate, but you know, the last time I was talking to um, Curl Holdings, which owns Old Parkland, you know, they're building like um, another a few hundred thousand square feet of speculative mm-hmm. office space, and they have a waiting list from all over the country because everybody wants in on this. Because if you can get into Old Parkland, you can get into the old money pockets of Dallas. Um, I mean, it's it's a uh, it's one of those where they they not only have space and they, it's not only just a club. It's also networking. They have thought leadership events. They have. I mean, they have you ever been inside their underground debate hall, Geo? See, this is why I would say something really inappropriate that would be uncensored, like saying <laughs> oh. I'm not allowed in there because mm. I'm not of that sophisticated oh. class level. Well, I'm, I'm, not, a Jesuit I'm guy, not either. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very sophisticated either, but I know people that are. And so sometimes they have offices <laughs> there and I get invited to the occasional lunch in which I'm sitting around gawking at everybody going like, yeah. wow, this yeah. is really good food. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost it's like the Cowboys club. club. It, uh, so yeah, I think yeah that's exactly what I was thinking about. It's yeah, better than seen. the Cowboys club. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a different I, level, right? And I guess what level. I meant by it, at the Cowboys club, you literally sign that you can't walk up to someone and ask for an autograph. You can't take right. pictures of the people. 
because you have, you know, athletes and celebrities walk around, but it's the same way in this situation is it's they don't want, they don't want people to be sitting, people. <laughs> yeah, they don't want people to be sitting at a table and you walk up to a big family fund and ask for an investment or a donation or any of that. I mean, and that's the goal. That's why they're very uh, careful about who they let in and to what level, right, is, mm -hmm. and so I think that's kind of switching gears back to the amenity world is that's what's happening is we need to incentivize people and give a reason to go to work, right? It's no longer we're providing a sit-stand desk and a, the stuffy old school gym that may have a Peloton or two and, and a cafe. It's, it's, it's about more than that. And that's really what drives people to, to be incentivized to make that 20, 30 minute commute into the office in most cases. Um, so I think amenization is huge. But the right amenities, not just yeah. for the, right. yeah, because we've gone through that stage, I feel like, where. Where the ping yeah. pong table that went unused right. in the corner or the massage yeah. chair that, you know, no one really wanted to get a massage in after right. that <laughs> one guy decided to, <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, I've seen some awkward amenities in the office where it's like, okay, like this is a little awkward of an amenity, but I've also, um, so I was recently in CoStar's Northern Virginia office for sort of a newsroom summit where I got to chat with colleagues from, you know, all over the country, from New York to Canada to elsewhere. And, you know, they had a Starbucks machine that made a perfect chai latte, yeah, just I like mean, you were like, I mean, just yeah. like, yeah. I don't know if you've seen this machine. I mean, I wanted, and they had like it, it up on a beautiful amenity floor, like overlooking like this gorgeous river. And um, I'm just like, can I just sit like the entire newsroom team went up to this amenity level and worked, even though they offered other, you know, conference <laughs> rooms where like, no one's like, we're sitting there like pushing that button for the chai latte. I mean, caffeine views, sunlight. I mean, that just made yeah. all the difference on working. I mean, if I worked in Virginia in the same, I'm sure with all other reporters, no one would actually work at their desks. We'd all just work from this beautiful huddled around, the <laughs> huddled around the Starbucks machine, pushing for more caffeine. Yep. Yeah. Totally. There's a, um, mind space geo, you know, mind space. I don't know. Mind space, a co-working brand. Mm -hmm. They do those machines, not the Starbucks brand, but there's another one that to your point, like I'm a cappuccino drinker, but I'm not oh, going to buy I love one out cappuccino. of like, yeah. not out of the bad machine, you know, not like, oh, we're not like a yeah. 7-Eleven machine, but like the, to your point, like tastes like someone just made it for me. And they put mm -hmm. one on every floor in their buildings. And I think it's so smart because so smart. I just, if there was one close enough to me, take my money. Yeah. To your point, I'm just going <laughs> to sit here right here on this beautiful sofa and drink your cappuccinos <laughs> isn't it funny but that's what makes yeah productive sometimes the fact right. that you don't have to think about where am I going to get my afternoon fix or yeah. my morning fix or what if it's a bad day and I'm going to need three cappuccinos right? today you know what I mean like you just don't even <laughs> want to like think about it it's sort of on autopilot and it just sort of like as you're working is sort of supplied to you. I mean, you yeah. don't even know how it you comes know, it's just to lighter, right? Cause you're like, oh, oh yeah. and it's good. And it's not just yes. coffee, it's special. Yeah. So I think it and it's not simple. a Keurig. It's yeah. Right. Yeah. Not the Keurig. Exactly. No Keurig. Which I don't mind a Keurig, you know, I mean, oh, sometimes, I mind a Keurig. <laughs> sometimes beggars can't be choosers. Where you're but like, I think that's the point. You want people to feel like your hospitality. It's, a, mm -hmm. you know, it's about hospitality. So yes. Um, I'm curious just to switch gears from kind of the softer stuff to for a minute. What what yeah. was the discussion around the capital markets? Um so, and the, the lack yeah. thereof, just for people who kind of aren't as tied into that. So uh as I mentioned, I was at ULI this week, but also, you know, CBRE, world's largest brokerage firm, was also based here in Dallas. Um, they released earnings yesterday morning. Um in it, the CEO was talking about how bad capital mar markets have gotten and sort of how they, you know, they were sort of projecting double digit growth throughout the year, but they really, you know, things did not go well after Labor Day um, because of this. And I mean, capital markets are having issues for multiple reasons, yeah. right? You have debt that's really hard to get these days. Um, no one really knows the true price of property. So it makes people hesitant to trade hands when they're, they don't want to pay 20, 30% more than they should. Um, and, you know, is one 
panelists said at the ULI conference was like, you know, if you're not kidding yourselves, because that I think a lot of times real estate people and everyone's, like, oh, no, the values really are here. So if you're not kidding yourselves, yes, there's a huge dent in valuations of properties. It's just no one knows how much that is. And no one wants to, I mean, debt's hard enough to get. Where do you want to place your, you know, capital buckets? Like, yeah. and so there's just, there's a lot of questions right now. Um, uh, another panelist said, now is a good time to be like a turtle and put your head in the shell and don't really like think about the next six to nine months because, you know, we're, we're headed into a recession. Um, I think there's a lot of questions as to um, how long that recession will be. There's a lot of geopolitical turmoil yeah. in the world. Um, we even have some domestic turmoil, but we're, I mean, real estate can be a great hedge you know, in a, a recessionary environment, um, you just have to kind of sort of pick your right property. And um, there's questions on what that right property looks like. Um, it, it, probably garden style apartments, frankly. I don't know. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, especially with the office space, you know, there's so much space sort of on the sublease market and there's shadow sublease space in which, you know, tenants aren't fully occupying or using or you utilizing their space as they once did. And everyone's sort of looking at, well, what does that mean to my office portfolio? And I don't know, just a lot of questions, right? Gio, I feel like I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, but basically, you know, the reason why capital markets are important is because then you have companies like CBRE who, you know, is going to, they're, they've already said, we're going to slash $400 million in expenses in the next six months. Yeah. Um, that includes employees yeah. and there's going to be layoffs and there's going to be severance and, you know, how, to what degree, I mean, CBRE, if you're listening, please get back to my media requests because I <laughs> want to know, but you already know this. So, um, you know, I think that's the question mark to what degree. And I think we're just going to have to wait and see because, you know, public companies only have to disclose so much and um, we'll, we'll be there. To report yeah. During it. these times, it's, it's so interesting uh, because in our industry from a real estate standpoint, this is the time to shift and change. Right. And so right. there's a lot of companies adjusting. There's a lot, we're seeing a lot of big names um, move companies. You just covered an article about that. A lot going on with that. I mean, one of your colleagues, uh, Tony Wilbert, just covered, literally just came out with the AY. We actually hired uh, a really chief operating officer for the capital market side. Um, and so she came over with the idea of building and preparing the catapult out of this, right? Yeah. Because during these times, it's about getting creative, right? It's the deals that are going to be killed because of the capital markets industry and where we are in interest rates and all that, there's still the ability to be creative, right? I'm looking at a couple of deals right now where it didn't make sense before, but now because there's a loan assumption, right? And we can assume someone's debt at a lower interest rate. It all of a sudden makes sense because mm -hmm. if we go out and find something at seven and a half, we can basically assume into something at four and a half or five. We're going, well, <laughs> these are the only projects that make sense now. And so it's during these times, it's about getting creative. There's, there's no doubt that there's going to continue to be opportunities out there. Cash is king. You know, we saw it through the pandemic, right? The people that had cash and were on the sidelines uh, made a lot of money through that two year period. Right. And we can argue where we are in that pendulum. Are we out of it? Or are we not? But, but ultimately that's where we're headed into right now is I hate to say it. A lot of banks are going to be taking back office buildings specifically um, and there's a lot of those conversations already being had because people are coming up on leases rolling and there being, you know, that gap there. We're coming up on uh, refinance times. Companies have to refinance. I mean, I've run into a couple of people that are having issues with they had a great construction loan. They're running out of their construction loan and they got to roll into, a, you know, a new loan. And for the asset, and it doesn't make sense now. And so they don't have the tenants. And so they're having to start looking at flex space and opportunities like that. I mean, Jamie and I have worked on some assignments that are like that. Um, 
right now where they've got high vacancy and they're trying to figure out what to do. And you've got Regis out throwing, you know, boilerplate letters asking every landlord who has space available if they want to do a management deal. You've got industrious doing the same. You've got, you know, we work learning how to do that from Common Desk. So you got a lot of these things going on. And so it's funny, you know, this this assignment that Jamie and I are working on, they came to us and they said, hey, you know, Reed just called us and we started asking them questions and they couldn't answer the questions for us, right? Because they didn't do a whole lot of research into why they're doing the deal. They just, you know, they're, they're trying to find people that are willing to do a management deal. And so that's right. where during these times, us real estate experts and, and consultants like Jamie can find opportunity, right? Because we're helping people kind of work through the, the, the turbulent times and what does that look like and deal structures and everything else. But I, I want to be very clear. I mean, now's the time to be positive, not negative, right? Because I think mm -hmm. we're going to catapult out of this. And for those that are willing to put the time, energy, and effort and have the expertise, we'll find a way to make it through this, right? And so oh, yeah. it's, it's exciting times for the flex industry overall. Yeah, with, uh, with anything comes opportunity. And I mean, that was something that CBRE's um, president, CEO, Bob Celentic was saying, you know, there's, there's so much opportunity. It's just, you know, you have to kind of go through these bad times to, uh, to get there and kind of refigure out, okay, what are we going to focus on? Um, I do know, like in terms of deal making and capital markets, CBRE, you know, they have had deals that they've just they're they're putting everything on hold, and mm -hmm. the, I imagine they're not alone. So, um, yeah, it's just different opportunities, right? <laughs> and it's about being able to get creative, right? And you know, I, I don't yeah. know. I think there's going to be a there's going to be headwinds, right? But there's also with those comes comes things that come through. And I mean, I, I know that Jamie was talking about how busy her next week is um, because there's all kinds of people that she's helping through, you know, different levels of growth or contraction or, you know, everything in between operations. Um, and so I think that's that's the the really unique part where, you know, some of us again, uh, professional. Uh, real estate experts and, and consultants have the ability to help people through that. And I mean, that's a big part of the conversations you get to have is, you know, again, going back to the assignment you're currently working on is, you know, how are some of these enterprise groups weathering these storms and how are they shifting and adjusting to making short to midterm decisions, not long-term decisions? Mm -hmm. So I have a question, Jamie, Gio, you guys are experts here. Um, you know, one thing that came up at ULI was the talk about the old 1960s, 1980s office buildings, you know, with the huge football hmm. fields, <laughs> type floor plates. Um, and, you know, there's been talk about, you know, how to convert this to residential. Sometimes residential makes sense, sometimes not so much because, you know, the residential buildings were more, you know, smaller buildings, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, those uh, seem to fit a little better there. How do you flex or change or convert a space like a big giant freaking office building in the middle of a downtown Dallas, but in the middle of really any downtown skyline where that's not what tenants want anymore. Everybody wants a window. No one wants to sit in the dark, gloomy space center part of a skyscraper. I mean, how, how should um, landlords and developers look at converting these types of unusable floor plates? Jamie, go for it. You're on mute. I am on mute. Um, it's a good question. I mean, there are assets that I look at, I'm in the Bay Area and I'll, mm -hmm. you know, cruise around and think no one's ever coming back to these buildings. <laughs> So I yeah. think that's, right. There's that's some thought. of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a, it's a great question. It feels really challenging to think of all that space, like, um, sitting empty or it, I, I think, you know, to the point we talked about earlier, maybe you can create an experience that makes it compelling. Um, I do think today people, are, you know, the, the, the whole consumerization of work where people are saying, 
yeah, I'm, you know, I'm choosing my space and I'm never going to choose the internal, right. Depths of, uh, 40,000, you know, foot floor plates. So how do you, how do you manage that? Some of that I think does become, you know, kind of unusable. Maybe you put an indoor pickleball court, uh, on the floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think (laughs) it'll be really hard. And so I, I do think landlords have to probably be pretty to your point. Um, wait, what did you say? Not, uh, not sort of um, like being realistic, you know, about yeah. That space. No, don't cage yourself. Up, yeah. Yeah, exactly. When it comes it's, up for renewal, what are what are the opportunities? Um, I mean, there's always going to be. I think there will be some. Actually, we had um, Brandon Medeiros. Have you run into Brandon? He's um, he's helping asset owners and occupiers kind of figure out supply and demand. He okay. has a theory that there will be. Um, some like dynamic pricing around space. Cause I was asking him oh, about the whole, like, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So like, uh, the Monday, Friday problem, you know, mm-hmm. that like nobody's going to any office on Monday or Friday. So how do you manage that? How do you manage like having enough space for everybody who wants to come in and yet you're, you know, Monday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but then you're, so his theory was that some of this, like less than amazing real estate, will get reconfigured to be fairly flexible and maybe it's not super high end and that people with budgets will sort of manage accordingly. Like they'll put some of the budget against really great space on mm-hmm. Wednesday. And sometimes they'll use some of the budget like for team meetings or gatherings or whatever, uh, if they're running out of budget, you know, Monday, Friday. And so it's, not that interesting. It, yeah. Dynamic so office space. Dynamic office demand. space. So not every asset owner is like going to be set up to run it that way, but it's an interesting sort of perspective on uh, if there's a flight to quality, but the quality sort of runs out and you can't convert everything to high quality. Maybe there's, yeah, a use for it. That, that's maybe. what, that's my uh, contribution. Gia, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it depends market by market, right? I mean, continue to use Dallas as an example is we're in we're in dynamic growth mode, right? And now mm-hmm. is the time to prepare for coming out of this thing, right? I mean, if we're building an office building, if we're building, you know, things like that, you're coming to the ground now. You're basically, in my opinion, basically opening as we come out of the, the recession, right? And so giving you great examples, it's hard to find good urban infill real estate right now. We just recently had, and Jamie, you don't know the market as well as, as Candace does, but right next to the Ross Pro building in Uptown, we had a, an apartment complex that was essentially, it was real interesting because it was in the middle of Uptown, right? But they had like a Section 8 housing component, like um, mm-hmm. I guess economic... A rent structure to it where I think some of these groups and I'm not a multifamily guy so uh, sorry if I don't explain this right but up to like 20 percent has to be put aside for affordable for, housing for affordable housing mm-hmm. there you yep. go. And they usually so, do that when they have like an is- incentive like there was some right. sort of city incentive yeah. like they won't give right. them out unless there's an affordable component yeah yeah right and so they have to show taxes and all that but they just knock that thing down because they're going to build a big a high-rise office building Right. And so I think that there is not going to be opportunities for highest and best uses within this, these urban infills to reuse some of those buildings. Right. And and create, you know, if there was 100,000 square foot floor plate or whatever, now you're going to create two towers that have 40,000 square foot floor plates. Right. So you have more window offices, more amenities, yeah. more of that stuff. And so, yes, to your question is, I mean, looking at. Uh, it's funny, I was looking at that ULI list that came out here recently where Nashville's at the top of it, Austin's up there. Oh, yeah. Denver, Dallas is and... number two. Yeah. I actually so have, have it right these... here. Oh, look at you. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I'm starting to look. I'm like, oh, yeah. This is. Yeah. And so if you run down that that list, right, those, mm-hmm. those top 10 cities, right, there's an opportunity to go back and reuse that space, right? Here in Dallas, kind of, I came out of the retail world. You both know that. Um, you go back and look at these malls that, you know, some have been converted to power centers in some way, shape or form. You have big boxes. Others were turned into like call centers or some type of data center. And then some were completely flattened and became Walmarts and and power centers. And others, 
have become really cool mixed use developments. And so the same thing's going to happen with these buildings. People are going to get creative, right? Um, you know, one of the projects I was talking to you earlier, I mean, we're looking at getting in the building for 60 bucks a foot, right? Which is unheard of for an office building, right? And so, but the reality is, you know, that's the only way to make the numbers work or someone's trying to dump it. And so that's, that's ultimately the shift we're seeing as opposed to, you know, you're looking at buildings at 300 bucks a foot um, to, to 500. I mean, I think one of them's about to trade here in town at McKinney and Olive, I think North is 750 a foot, yeah. right? Um, and so ultimately there's a use for that real estate, right? Mm -hmm. Now, my question more so is along the lines of what does happen in the San Francisco's, the Chicago's, uh, you know, some of those, uh, Seattle, Portland, Minneapolis, some of those centers, uh, city centers that were, were highly affected over the last few years, right? Where people are afraid to go back into, or people are trying to leave. I mean, I've toured stuff in, in Portland where the companies inside of that county, uh, and I've got to go back and look at what county that is, but essentially they put in a new ordinance towards uh, drug and homelessness, right? And so they're actually have a new tax incentive that's hitting everyone within that, that corridor, right? And so people are trying to, to find locations right outside of the county, right? You're still in Portland, but they're no, wonder, no longer wanting to be there, not only because of safety issue, not only because of a cost issue, but also because of how they're being affected by taxation, right? And so those are all things that are coming into, a, a, you know, into the picture of, of how people are looking at these spaces, how developers can make projects work. I mean, is there tax incentives? Is there other things outside of that that are driving these things? But I mean, here in Dallas, just continue to use that. I mean, they're about to redo the, the convention center, which is already huge and beautiful, but it is. They're going to make it better so nice. to drive more people here. I mean, you go out to watch the Texas Rangers and you walk by a 20 year old beautiful ballpark and they basically built a new one next door just because they wanted to cover it. And it's still great. But I, I think the old ballpark looks better and is, you know, a lot more uh, historical. Right. As opposed to just one of these new big ballparks. But you know, I, I think that's the same way people are having to make those shifts and dynamic changes. Um, but there's always a way to, way to reuse those spaces um, for people that are willing to get creative with it. There is, but it seems like there's been, it, 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 it's been a problem for decades, especially in downtown Dallas. What vacancies at more than 25 percent. It's been yep. more than 25 percent since I've covered Dallas in real estate. Right. I mean, it's been like that for a long period of time. And while you mentioned like malls and the redevelopment of malls, I mean, malls are regional. So they're sort of spread out throughout mm -hmm. the region, appealing to co-working companies, retailers, anyone that wants to get closer to rooftops. Um, where downtown Dallas, you have millions of square feet of space that's going unused. Yeah that you know what I mean like it's a it's a very condensed problem in this one yeah. area and what are you going to do with it I mean uh short of you know making them all data centers or you know if Texas ever you know passes a cannabis law like have little like indoor farms I mean yeah, I don't yeah. I don't I, what what else would you use for that space I like that, well uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I won't take credit for it. Again, I just, uh, you know, was covering ULI and one of the panelists mentioned this. So I'm yeah, totally yeah. stealing his idea. I think it it could work because like I said, you know, you have big caverners, cavernous spaces, yeah. dark. Um, no one really wants to work there anymore. So maybe you grow plants. I don't know. Or yeah, And I mean, I, I think this is just a bigger conversation that affects things for for not for decades, right? Because, you know, it's, it's funny, we're, as we're sitting here, I mean, we've started early voting kind of across the, the country, I believe. Um, I know here we have here in Dallas, but so much of what we're voting for today is gonna affect things the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. And the reason I say that is because the problem with Dallas is, Dallas should have been, number one, we should have focused on redeveloping downtown Dallas before we built uptown, right? So the political powers that be at that time decided to allow for Uptown to, to, to grow without dealing with the issues with 
with downtown first, which just made downtown become less desirable, right? Because now you have these awesome new buildings and amenities outside of, of the CBD, right? And that's why Uptown's doing very well, um, but downtown isn't, right? I mean, another part that was decided is when we were voting on, you know, the Cowboys, um, basically they decided to let the Cowboys stadium go back to and or, or go to Arlington as opposed to keeping it in Dallas and building it in the CBD, like so many of these other um, cities have done and created really cool urban sports arenas and stuff in a downtown area. And so I say those things because, you know, some of these things have been going on for years. And it's like, how do we make that dynamic shift? I mean, downtown Dallas, they switched some of these really cool office buildings to hotels or revitalized all the hotels that are now really cool, trendy hotels and everything else. But for, I mean, the, the Dallas issue has been an issue way before this recession, way before the pandemic. Most retailers down there, probably restaurants as well, are on percentage rent with landlords. Um, you know, they're, I've got tax incentives to go down there. And so I think I challenge people to look past where we are today or really look into the past because the issues today were created 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so we're still, I mean, like Dallas is a lot more, uh, revitalized and a lot more vibrant today than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And so we're going to continue clawing our way out of that and stuff is going to continue to, to find a way to be reused. And, um, you know, there, there is something beautiful about some of those old buildings downtown that have a, a story to them, but you've got to have the incentives and the ability to go in and do all the, yeah. you know, the, overhaul of asbestos and you know just plighted issues that, that have arisen because these these buildings have been used for a long time i mean it's a complicated issue that it's hard to put it at the city's feet or one person yeah i don't think any one person is responsible for anything other than you know you have a lot of property owners that make each of their individual decisions um you've got trammell crow center that recently traded this year they have invested hundreds of millions of dollars into that um, property as well as the next door development to make it have the parking ratio that's desired to have the upgraded space and amenities, you know, with that first floor retail space. Um, so, I mean, it takes individual property owners, it takes city incentives to your point, but I mean, Jerry Jones decided to move the Cowboys to Arlington. I mean, that was because he decision. didn't get enough incentives because he didn't get enough incentives. Right. Um, and, but, and that's a part of it. But right? at the same time, I mean, he could have also made a different decision. I, yeah, yeah, but the reason I, I hate know. the Cowboys is because he cares only about Jerry Jones, right? You've got other team owners and other people that have made decisions differently, right? And so Correct. I think, I mean, Mark Cuban, same thing. He, at one point, he had the option to move, uh, move the Mavericks, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think there's so many different levels of these decisions that have to be made. That you can, I mean, who would have guessed that old Parkland going back to that was going to become what it's become, right? It could have been oh, yeah. worn down. They could have done all kinds of stuff with it, but they chose to put a ton of money into it and and basically make it something really beautiful. Even Jamie, I'll send pictures to you, right? Actually, I, I did send a couple articles to you, but those new buildings they're building, they're making them look like the old historical buildings, right? And right. that's, there's a huge cost to that versus just putting up a regular, you know, brick and mortar building tilt wall or something like that. I know. That is There's more none efficient. of that. Yeah. No. I mean, they want this to be a, a campus for the next hundred years or more. Yeah. And it shows, I mean, speaking of Parkland, I mean, Middle Parkland is getting demolished as we speak. I mean, that could have been something, but could have, would have, yeah. should have. Now it's coming down. So yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of Parklands here, Jamie. We have the old Parkland the middle parkland okay. <laughs> and the new parkland okay so lots of iterations here i i feel like dallas especially for dallas developers it, it's like newer is always better and then they leave like these like exoskeletons to the side that That's then someone else <laughs> someone else has to deal with <laughs> not my monkey not my circus we're just uh, gonna shuffle across the street here yeah yeah, but all those things being said, I mean, I wouldn't bet against San Francisco, Chicago, 
the the cities, Seattle, I mean, those cities are going to come back. The question is, how long does it take them to come back? Right? What does it and, look like and how do they yeah. solve the challenges that are in front of them right now? Yep. And I think that's back to your point, Candice, was a great point. It's on all of us, right? I'm not sitting here saying it's it's one one group or one party, but it, it's all of us kind of trying to figure out and getting creative. I mean, we're, we're trying to help some clients get out of buildings in, in Seattle and Portland and Minneapolis. And, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. We just have to get creative on some of those things. So what is their reasoning behind, behind this wanting to get out of these places? Like, what do they say? Well, for example, again, you know, Jamie and I help operators, right? And so if an operator is not making money, they, they have to get out, right? It's yeah. not like, you know, I'm not personally advising, you know, the JP Morgan's, Toyota's, the Amazon's of the world that are going, oh, we're, we want to get out of here because, you know, it's, yeah. it's not the right place for us or because, you know, there's not enough tax. It's none of that stuff, right? I mean, we've got a lot of people that are making choices and committed to play. I mean, look what the Waltons have done with Bentonville, right? I mean, yeah. single-handedly, the Waltons have put Bentonville on the map, right? Um, because they required all their vendors to be there, right? I mean, so you've got that. You've got Amazon, who's committed to their headquarters. I mean, I was just in Nashville this week, and you know they're building a huge campus there, right? They've got their their Virginia presence that you mentioned earlier, and so you know, I think there's a difference between operators and enterprise users and developers, right? Is these operators, I mean, a lot of the people that Jamie and I advise are individuals. And you know this well, because, you know, you know, some of the people yourself and everything else, but these are people that have put their retirement on the lines that have put their hard earned money on the lines. And so in a lot of cases, they're trying to get out because they're losing money. And they, at some point, you got to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not looking to go somewhere else. They're trying flat out, just trying to get out of the business altogether. Um, and go focus on their key businesses. I mean, you've got a lot of franchisees that were pulled in uh, that were hospitality driven groups, right? Serendipity Labs went out and sold a lot of these hospitality groups with the idea that it was just like running a hotel. Um, you've got other people within the same, you know, flex industry that thought it was easy, right? And so now they're going, hey, you know what? The hotel industry's back. I want to focus on the hotel industry. I want to take this off my books because it's a distraction. I mean, those are real conversations that we're having. And I mean, the reality is the flex industry is still coming out of, or really it's still having growing pains, right? We don't have a, a price line. We don't have a hotel tonight. We don't have a Bonvoy. We don't have any of those big offerings, right? Where it's really easy to fill up space. And so I know you asked a general question, but the reality is who we advise are flex operators and landlords and you know so the operators are trying to figure out how to bail uh, because they're not making money then the landlords are going oh by the way now we're left with this space that's built out what do we do with it and so we're trying to go okay is there a different use within flex that works there or is it just not viable right in some of our cases you've got operators that either thought it was going to be easier than it is that are passive right they're hands-off uh, operators and then you've got those that really, you know, have the ability to operate a space. And it's just not in the right place. Jamie, that is interesting. Your the, the right place has changed, it sounds yeah. like. Jamie, would you yeah. agree with all that? Yep, I do agree with you. Yep. Wow. Yeah, and a lot of movement to your point. So lot, along the coastal markets, basically, it's no longer the right place that it once was. I think it depends. I think the West Coast in particular is having some challenges with its major cities. Really, a lot of socioeconomic, um, you know, reasons. LA, yeah, all the West Coasters. And the reality is, they are the right place, and they will be right. I mean, yeah, I had right. just in LA, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful!" But we sat down and looked at this view, and five homeless people walked up and tried getting money. Yeah, while they were sitting there, and so how do we address those things? But again, in the long run, I don't, I don't bet against any of those. I mean, no, San I Francisco totally will absolutely be back. Yep. Um, are they going to have their issues? Yeah, like every other city. Every I mean, city. I was there 10 years ago when I was with, with Regis, and I was like, it smells like weed and urine on the streets. Well, <laughs> that it's a down, I hate to say it, it's a downtown. That's not going to, you can only control those things to such a level. But um, 
but all those all, all those cities are going to come back right it's not like you know they're going to end up looking like gotham from batman or anything exactly i'm sure that was a hot topic at uli too okay i have to go get my windshield wipers fixed okay <laughs> this was lovely that's quite an ending <laughs> I know. I was like, I'm going to have to just be. Um, You're like, hard stop, hard stop. <laughs> Wait, and Candace, it's your Friday afternoon and we just took like over an hour. So you got stuff to do. Yeah. Some my editors are probably try. like, uh, yeah, yeah. Wait for, <laughs> wait for more stories to come. But uh, Jamie, we'll have to have you so back nice. on because right, yes. I feel like there's, there's lots we could dive into. It was wonderful to meet you and thank you for sp- spending an hour of your Friday afternoon with us. No, thank you guys so much. Take care. All right, bye. Bye, y'all.